to this point in my life where it's like nothing can stop me. And when you talk like that, people say, oh, he's arrogant. You know what I mean? But hopefully they'll get to a point in their life where they'll talk like that, too, because that has nothing to do with arrogance. That has something to do with wanting to be great. From Stu to Greatness, I'm Stu Holt, and I am here with a special guest, man. He is a musical artist. He is the founder and creative director of Black Owned Outerwear. He's Macho Mean. Sonny, I, I appreciate, appreciate you, man. 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 I appreciate you taking time out of your day, um, out of your busy schedule, man, and, and doing this interview, man. I yeah, really sure. appreciate that. I remember two years ago, about two years ago, we interviewed you on another podcast. Yep. And just to see your growth, man, it's, it's been amazing. Now, thank it's you. It's been amazing, man. Um, thank you for having me. Oh, for And allowing sure. me to wear these glasses since I... <laughs> Didn't get an opportunity to get any sleep last night. Hey, but that's that's the pursuit, man. That's the grind. That's the grind. What's going on though? Uh, nothing much, man. Nothing much. I just I want to talk about the the journey. You know how you got to where you are, um, and I know you guys want to go even further, right? You know, but let's start let's start talking about the the beginning stages, right? Black owned. The name Black owned. You know, I, when people hear that, it starts a conversation. Of course. You know, it starts a conversation. So where did that name? What's in the name of Black owned? Everything is in the name, actually, you know. Uh, the name itself uh, was intended to spark these conversations, you know. Fashion is just what we use to promote it, the idea of black owned, you know what I mean? So the name for us was everything. That's why we, we started with the name. We didn't start with designs and then put a name to it. We started with our name and uh, we knew who we wanted to reach. And um, so that's why we we coined our, our clothing line black owned seven years ago when we started. There was a, a disconnect there. There's a lot of fashion lines out there. Um, not many of them are black designers, you know, or at the time they weren't getting highlighted. Right. But we were spending a lot of money on fashion. But we also had a mission. You know, what I mean, that what we wanted to do uh, at the time was just promote that, that state of mind of ownership. Not just owning a business, but ownership of self, because that's that's just important. In fact, before you can own a business, you have to have ownership of self. You know what I mean? Self-discipline. You got to have a path that you that you had, you know, for yourself. So that ownership just overall is what we wanted to promote. And we wanted to use fashion to get it to the people. And uh, it's been working. Sure. Yeah. It's been working for sure, man. And. You know, and that's that's interesting that you say that about because it is true. Like I heard people say, "Be the CEO of yourself," and that you know what I mean. You've yeah. got you've got to hold that's yourself accountable. That's your first operation, mm. of some sort. That's your first business, yourself. Right. You know how you manage yourself, how you manage your time, how you are with people, how you manage your relationships. That's a that's a business. You know what I mean, knowing when to give, knowing what you can give, knowing what you can't give. Right. That's inventory. Mm. So yeah. That's oh, yeah, deep. You, you got it. That's so, deep. That's deep, man. So what were the first days? What did that look like? The first days of starting Black Owned, the beginning stages. What did, what did that look like? Those first, first days. The first days of Black Owned was me getting on the phone, probably a drop call because I've been on Sprint forever. Oh, Sprint. So I'm pretty sure I called Murph and said, hey, I want to start this clothing line in the call drop. <laughs> <laughs> and then I called him right back. But I, I told him, you know, I, I want to start a clothing line. And he's like, what's, what's the name of the clothing line? And I said, Black On. And he's like, why Black On? I'm like, you know, I explained to him the scenario that I had just went through and just the mindset that I was in at the time. And I knew, like, we were both, um, I would say, popular people in our community, mm -hmm. people that had respect. You know what I mean? But we were known to be workers and hustlers. And um, that's why he and I linked up in the first place. Uh, we, we first connected through the music. But anyway, um, yeah, that was the early stages, me calling him, letting him know what I wanted to do. And uh, just knowing the type of person that he is, I knew that I can lean on him to be like the perfect business partner. And here we are seven years later, 
And technically, there's no such thing as a perfect business partner because I'm not even the perfect business partner. But, you know, in a way, we're, we're perfect for what we're doing. Right. I mean, we understand our roles and so on and so forth. But yeah, I called up Merck, told him what I wanted to do. He's like, how we doing it? I'm like, well, I want to take black on. I got a design. I got an idea. I want to put it on sweatshirts. This is the first conversation. And he's like, why a sweatshirt? And I, I remember telling him, like, because that's what college kids wear. Mm. Because I was fresh out of college, and um, all the kids would wear sweatshirts to class because it was comfy, right. keep you warm. Right. But you know, pretty much in the hood, nobody was really wearing sweatshirts. If anything, we were wearing hoodies. So he like sweatshirts. I'm like, yeah, trust me, we're gonna do it on a sweatshirt. So we went and you know bought all the sweatshirts we can find, and uh, that's kind of how we started. But that was the early days. We we pretty much bought these Hanes sweatshirts from all the targets. And we would take them and put our logo on them. All right. You know, and people look at what we do now because we do cut and sew pieces where we design our own pieces. But it wasn't always like that. You know what I mean? So you, you do start somewhere. The goal is to not be there forever. So um, the first black owned shirts, it was uh, 15 black owned shirts. Okay. It was myself and 14 other guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, what I did was after talking to Merck, we wanted to figure out how we was going to pay for the production mm -hmm. and uh we so i went to everyone i said look i'm starting a clothing line i need 20 bucks from all of you and then once i um finish i'm finished with the shirt i'll deliver it to you and we're gonna wear it on this day mm -hmm. actually it was my homie's muhammad's birthday and he's a really popular dude so i'm like let's all wear them on his birthday to mix nightlight mix ultra lounge if you remember that club okay. big club you know it's not, not here anymore, but anybody from Cincinnati know about the mix. Mm -hmm. Shout out to j Rod. So I'm like, let's wear it on this day. We all wore them on that day. And the next day, we literally had, you know, a bunch of Facebook orders. People who wow. were like, I saw this shirt you all had on last night. How can I get it? Right. So we immediately, like, we bought into the hype and we, like, ran out to the targets mm -hmm. and started buying up all the sweatshirts because right. we wanted to make sure that we had enough to cover our orders. And uh, we haven't looked back since. Wow, man. So we started with a sweatshirt, and now we we got leather jackets and slides. and yeah. Dang, that's dope, man. That's this dope. couch is actually black on, man. Believe it? It's black on? Yeah, it's black on. Yeah, because we sitting on Because we sitting in on. our store. <laughs> <laughs> no, Owned by black you. on. It's black on. But, okay, so, so hearing that, I feel like one of the biggest obstacles would be financial. Is that would you say that's one of the biggest obstacles or so what would somebody what does somebody do when financial piece that's that's the obstacle that's keeping them from I think every small business battle with capital. Okay. Enough capital to expand your business, your ideas. Mm -hmm. Because you can be growing but the money isn't coming in fast enough where you can take that money and use it to do more. Right. per se, because you're constantly reinvesting what you do have. But you, you may want to scale a little faster. So that, that capital is always an issue, yeah. you know, when you're growing a business. But like for what we did for the first shirts that we produced, we could have took the money out of our pocket and went and bought the sweatshirts and produced them mm -hmm. and then went to our friends and said, this is what we have. Can you buy it? But now you got you to gotta sell the actual item and you already have money involved. But in business, what they call OPM is figuring out a way to use other people's resources or money to produce what you want to produce and then sell it. That way you don't tie up your own capital. So capital is an issue, um, but I think there's creative ways for entrepreneurs to find capital. One is being able to pre-sale in fashion and finding ways that you can pre-sale items so on and so forth to bring in money. But yeah, capital is, even right now, right. seven, seven years, years later, later, capital is one of the things that we still you know, struggle with, right. being able to do everything that we want to do, you know, to fund these bright ideas. Right. See, that's, that's the thing, though. Like you, I heard somebody say, find a way. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, if you, wanna, if you have an idea and you want it to get out there, you just got to find a way. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's going to be a lot of good excuses. At the end of the day, they're excuses, though. And so you have to find a way to get your stuff made, get your stuff out there, you know, if you really want to be successful. Yeah, I agree. Um, true entrepreneurs, one, you know you, there's failure in the process. 
A failure doesn't necessarily mean that you're done. Right. It just means that you got to do it again. See, you got people that look at it two different ways. You right. know? So for me, when we fail, it just means like, oh, sh shucks, like, oh, shit, we got to do it over. That's what that means to me. So uh, that's pretty much what we base our whole operation on. Like, we know that we're going to be successful. And, and mind you, success is a fluid concept, but for us, we, we have an idea in mind, in mind what, where we want to be. But we know we're going to get to that point. We just don't know like the time, exact time frame, but we understand that it takes time, that failure is a part of the process. But it all goes back to that financial piece. Right. You know, like if you got your numbers in place, you know, your projections and understanding your product, what it, co what it really costs you versus what you think it costs you. And I know these are things that some people, when you first start up, you don't understand. Mm -hmm. But I would say when you start in a brand or any business, the number one thing you should be focused on is your financials. You know, as for myself, I'm a creative. I would rather just be in a room creating, thinking of things, ways to reach people, designs, so on and so forth. But that financial piece is just as important. So having a, being able to raise the capital, knowing that you're going to knock on doors and people are not going to answer, right. but still knocking door, going door to door. And eventually you'll find someone to say, this is a good product. And I see where you all can make money and maybe I can help you all do this and tweak it a bit this way. So that financial piece early on is like, for me, key. Mm. It's like very important. Let's talk about the importance of persistency. You just, you just said knock on doors. Sometimes they're not going to open. Sometimes you're going to get rejected. So talk about the importance of continually knocking even when you don't get the opportunity you're looking for sometimes. Yeah, I mean, that's a concept that you get from... You're a baby. You don't remember, but as a baby, you were standing up, trying to stand on your own, and then you fall down. But even a baby, you know, to get up and like try it again, and eventually you're standing up. That simple concept is the same thing with anything else in life. Like you're trying to stand up on your own as an entrepreneur, and then you're gonna fall down. And then you have to be smart enough to know that you get once again. So being persistent is is key. Like we've had. People look at black owned and they they make an assumption that like black owned has to be like banking. Right. Those, Those people, people don't understand business. Mm. <laughs> they don't understand inventory, salary, marketing, um, traveling expenses. You know, so it's so much that goes into operating a business, the expenses, and you might not understand that it takes time before you get to this level where you're just clearing, like you're making a lot of money. Right. So people look at us and think like they're so good. That's why they're able to go get up and go to work every day. But that's it's just the opposite. We're just getting our wheels, you know, turning right. after seven years. So being persistent is the key to that, though, because had we gave up in year four when we were, ha were having one of our toughest years, you know, or year five when we was having one of our toughest years, there would be no black on. There would be this interview wouldn't be happening. And the kids that are watching, they wouldn't be able to still take in on this inspiration. But uh, we know that, like, the brand isn't for us. Like, the brand isn't for Means. The brand isn't for Mert, Gil or Tone, HD. The brand isn't for us. The brand is, like, literally for the community. Because just like you, you want to interview us because in some way, I'm sure you've been inspired. Right. That's why you're here. Exactly. So it's important for us to, you know, stay persistent because it's not just about us at this point. And when we started, it wasn't about us, but I think it was a little more about us then than it is now. Right. So being persistent is, we got all the motivation to stay at this. One, we want to make a living. Um, two, we want to leave something behind. You know, like the average lifespan of a brand, clothing brand, is three to five years. So coming in, knowing that, you know that like most brands come in, they want to make their money, get out, and move on. And, and that happens a lot. And it's not a bad thing, because the goal of an entrepreneur is to make money. But the ultimate goal for us is to create something that, even when we're gone, black owned is still around. You know, creating that that legacy. There's other brands out there that's been around for hundreds of years, right. um, and we want to create that, and we can, because there's a void there. There's a void for a brand that's making that exact statement. You had a similar brand years ago. You take a brand like. 
Fubu. You know, I think when they first started, their uh, their slogan was "For You by You," and then I think that graduated into "For Us by Us," like you know, because there was a sense of entitlement for our community. Like this is our space within fashion. You know what I mean? Because we we spend so much money on fashion. And then, as you can see, the hip hop element is its own piece to it. But we spend so money, so much money in this market. Why wouldn't we have a piece of it? So we can't let Fubu be the last big brand for the people. You know what I mean? So we're pretty, we're pretty like determined to make this a global brand, not just here in the U.S., but for Black people all over the world. But then our brand now, as you see, has grown beyond that because it's so much, it's a part of the community that people who aren't black have taken on our brand because they like what it stands for, what it represents, a positive thing. So absolutely, you see Asians wearing black on now, you see white people wearing black on now, you know, and that that'll continue to grow. Latinos wearing black on because it's bigger than just the black on portion of it. It's the whole concept, the state of mind, not a color line. Yeah, and that's dope, man. You got to be persistent for all of those reasons. And see, that's the thing. You're talking about it's for everybody and, you know, inspiring people. And somebody came in, right? It was a, it was a white male, came in and asked for an autograph, right? Yeah. Talk about, because you posted that, talk about why that was so significant. Um, what was it, Susan Taylor, you know, holding a shirt down, yeah. former editor-in-chief of Essence Magazine. Yeah. Talk about why that was such a significant moment. The, the whole scenario was crazy because uh, she just walked in. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Just was in town, visiting us. Um, one of our guys was downtown. We knew there was a convention, so we put someone down there to pass out flyers. Mm -hmm. and he was, you know, being a pest about it, like stop in, but that doesn't mean she was gonna come. Right. But she walked in while we were just doing what we usually do, and um, we were here talking about the brand and how we can, you know, grow it. And she saw a vision for it. And then these two white guys come in, and they're like, we read about the brand online, and we were inspired and we wanted to come in and make a purchase but he didn't want to wear the shirt he wanted it to be signed because he made it you know he brought it to our attention that he saw this being a bigger thing and he wanted to save his shirt for that bigger moment so that was big to us because like i said this isn't black you know man these are white men and not only are these white men these are white men who want us to sign their shirts mm. So for me, that was big one because we had Susan Taylor in the shop and she got to see that. Right. But it was just big because when we started this, we were getting hate mail. You know what I mean? We, we had people saying they were going to burn our shop down. Wow. Um, we had people saying they were going to do things to us, none of which we were really too concerned about. Right. You know what I mean, yeah, I mean, and there's time to take threats seriously, but we're, we're on guard, you know, but it, just to go from that to that, to go from having people making threats on your life or your business because of what it is, because they're so uncomfortable with who they are, that they got, they've got gotten that worked up, that they're making threats. Right. All we wanted to do was have a seat at the table. I knew black owned was provocative. I knew that it would make people have conversations about community, but that's exactly what we wanted because everyone else has free reign to be who they are. Because you'll see a guy walking down the street in a green shirt with the Italian flag on the front of it, and it'll say Italian. Right. And you'll think to yourself, like, he's obviously Italian. You know, you feel nothing in your spirit, your heart. You're like, he's Italian. But that, you take that same scenario, and you see a black guy walking down the street, and there's people of other nationalities, typically white people, and they see black on. They'll stop you and say, hey, what does that shirt say? Because they're uncomfortable. But why? Because we don't go in Chipotle and say, wait, why does it say Chipotle Mexican Grill? Why can't it just be like Chipotle Grill? We already accept that as their culture. Right. So that's our job, though. It's not their job to, like, one day wake up and say, okay, we're comfortable with black people being black people. It's our job, our job, to push that so that we're comfortable for ourselves. Because I went to an all-white university, and I wasn't comfortable at all. You know, when I look back on my college experience, I, I guess in my last year I found, you know, comfortability in being a student when I finally became comfortable with myself, but I spent three years being uncomfortable because it was, 
it was already a, a program in place. Right. And if you weren't on that program, then you were kind of like looked at like, well, you're an outsider and what you have going on isn't as important. So for me, this clothing brand was like elements of all of that. Like, I'm not going to live my life in that space. Like always tiptoeing around people just to say that I'm black. I'm black. I'm black as fuck, actually. Right. Like, I'm, I'm black, bro. Like, you feel me? And yeah. I'm comfortable with that. Like, right. That doesn't mean that I'm not, I'm not pushing for, you know, what other people may have going on because I've embraced things of, I've embraced other people's culture and, and, and I'm comfortable with that because I'm comfortable with myself and knowing that I can go down on the square and salsa dance and have a good time, even though I can't dance. <laughs> but I can go down on the square and do that right. and, and enjoy that because I'm, I'm understanding that this element of their culture is to be celebrated. Just like the element of us, hip hop culture and fashion is to be celebrated. And it's always been a part of our culture. Um, how we express ourselves. So, uh, black owned the fashion line is just an extension of, of those things and us being able to be comfortable. But when you see it on a shirt, it makes you like, damn, like you put it right on a shirt, right on a hat. For sure I did. Mm -hmm. Because I, I want to get to a point where when you see someone walking down the street, you don't second guess it. You don't think of it. You say to yourself, he's, ob he's black. Obviously I'm looking at it. So that's why he's wearing a shirt. But then for someone who's not, because then you might see a black guy wearing a soccer shirt and it may have an Italian flag on it. But that's because the soccer culture or Italian culture is synonymous or they've always been tied hand to hand, right? Soccer, uh, Italian culture, and then fashion, black owned culture. So if you see a white person wearing a black owned shirt, they're embracing fashion and the fact that black culture and fashion go hand in hand so they're, they're able to celebrate it and wearing our garments too. So you get to that point and you turning up for real. And we're seeing a few white customers like a week and I'm excited because that lets me know that we're, our job is being that's it, done. Right, and that you're making that progress. For you know, sure. Making those because if white people are comfor comfortable enough to wear it, then that definitely means that other people like myself, the me that was at Miami, Black people are comfortable. They're becoming comfortable with who they are because a lot of us aren't comfortable. We'll go places and become whatever it is there. We'll try to become that instead of going there and being us and allowing them to see what we are so that they can celebrate us. You feel me? Right. So. Mm. It's almost like a, th a thermometer and a thermostat, right? Somebody was telling me that the difference between those two, a thermometer, right, takes the temperature so it adjusts to whatever's in the room. A thermostat sets the temperature. There you go. You know what I mean? Yeah. So two different, you know, instead of, like you said, going somewhere and just trying to become that, you know, no, you're going to go there and you're going to set, set the, the pace. Exactly. exactly. Set the pace. Mm. For sure. And we've done that in Cincy. Cincinnati is a, you're my niece. She's <laughs> excited. <laughs> this is a family shop. Um, but yeah, we've done that in Cincinnati. And Cincinnati, you know, is a very conservative town. Mm -hmm. So for us to be able to do what we've done here. And now people are starting to accept what we're doing. Because I think at first people thought we were black owned so that we can say that, yeah, we don't like you. Or right. we don't like you. And we want our own. Uh, we do want our own. You know what I mean? But it has nothing to do with anyone else. Right. And that's what other cultures would tend to do. Like, they'll make it about them. How can you make black owned about you? It's not about you. It's about us. Right. So... But the brand is bigger than that, you know what I mean? So, and we'll, conti we'll continue to grow bigger than that because when we started, when I came out the gate, I didn't want to do to people what Miami did to me. That's why we said a state of mind, not a color line. Mm -hmm. We didn't create black owned to separate ourselves. We created black owned so that we can come to the table. Mm -hmm. Feel me? And we can be sitting here with everyone else and be just as comfortable in, in what we're doing. So. That's amazing. State man. of mind. State of mind, man. And see, you say you're black owned. Black owned. Black owned things. What's crazy is like seven years ago, man, when we was doing this, like not only were we getting hate mail from like, I'm assuming white people, mm -hmm. but we were getting phone calls from older black people. Wow. And they were asking us, and my business partner, Merck, can attest to this. They were asking us, why are you all doing this? Why are you starting trouble? 
And I remember one lady in particular said, why are you all starting trouble? And I'm thinking, what trouble are we starting? Mm. It's fashion. <laughs> right. But you think, like now, being black is cool. Now, being black, I say in the last five years, thank, you know, more so thankful to Instagram, where people were very expressive. And then also the, the worldly climate, you know, all this crazy stuff that goes on in the world that happens to black people. And we're such a forgiving people, you know what I mean? But all of this stuff has happened. Now, black people are, we're standing up. We're like excited. We're like, we're no longer afraid. Because I think the worst has already happened. They're shooting us down in the streets. You can't get along when you go to the bank. They're unfriendly sometimes, you know what I mean? The politics is crazy. Nothing feels right. So it's like almost to the point now, the worst has happened. So. We have no choice but to really look at each other and love each other. Like, I don't, I don't even understand how we see somebody black doing well and you have this thing in you where you feel uncomfortable about it or you're not happy for that person. Jealous. Jealous. Like, how, man? Like, when, if you know where, where, what, I'm, what I went through as a, as, a, as a kid, like most of us, like me, I grew up without a father. So to know, to know understand those things, like growing up without a father, you grow up in the hood. You got to fight all these barriers of being a black male, just being black in general, not even just a black male, a black person. And then when you finally get something to understand how hard that is to, to get to a point where you're starting to see success and to have people be upset with you about it is crazy because you got to know how hard it is to do anything. So now black people are being black is, is a thing now, I guess. And I hate to say it that way, but it is because now people are like, I'm black and that's just that. And that's that's beautiful. Right. So now people, it's more of a cool thing. So we, we get excited that on Instagram you see celebrities talking about black owned and you get artists in their song talking about black owned. That's dope. And it, it kinda it helps us too, you know, because yeah. now people like who know that we've been around this long and pushing this, mm -hmm. say like those guys were the young guys right. pushing that seven years ago. Mm -hmm. Because the mindset was already there. So now when you hear it in a record, you know, on Jay-Z's new album or you hear it on any artist, right. you make the connection. Like these young guys are pushing that. And now these people with the big following are pushing that. It's coming, it's coming together. Mm. Like we, we just want to, you know, be in the, in the mix of that because that's what makes us happy. Right. What I think, what I find interesting is like going back to when you said you got the phone call, the lady said, why are you starting trouble? Like, actually, if you look back in history, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Malcolm X, even Muhammad Ali, these are people who are seen as people who are what? Starting start trouble. trouble. You know what point. I mean? And that's, you, in the world, you need people who are willing to start, start some, some trouble, trouble. Right. who are willing to go against the, the norm, go against what people are accepting at the time, because if not, stuff's going to stay the same. Yeah. If Rosa Parks is like, you know what? I'll just go to the back of the bus. I ain't gonna start no trouble. Right. You know what I'm saying? Where you know where would we be? If Martin Luther King was like, you know what, man, I'm not trying to start no trouble. Yeah. Where would we be? Yeah. Oh, but that you're right. That's a very good point. We was amped up though. That yeah. that let me know. Like I'm the type of person that let me know from jump we had some. Mm. You know what I mean? Like if someone's gonna take time to write a letter mm -hmm. and send it to your shop, talking about what they're gonna ride by and do, you you own a something. So yeah, for sure. So when you got people hating, you own to something. You know what I mean? Even Typically, if, that's how it works. Even if even if it's and it's sad because a lot of times it's the people who you would think would be supporting, and that's yeah. how it happens a lot of times with every with anything. We done yeah. with that though, man. Yeah. It's already halfway through 2018. Mm -hmm. If you got any hate on you, you gotta let it go. Right. Like we done with that. Yeah. It take it take more energy to do that anyway. It does. Yeah. So yeah. it ain't no room for no hate. No room. That's why, you know, people. People would always come in and ask, like, what y'all think about this brand? You know, are y'all in competition with this brand? Lo other local brands, brands that were started, created here in Cincy. And our answer has always been the same. Like, we think that's great. It's more, it's more of us in the industry. Right. We understand how hard it is, though, you know, because, like, I, I come back to saying, like, people look at this like it's a glamorous thing. It's not always glamorous. So when people count it they say well then i'm gonna start my own 
Because most of our customers, that's what they did. They started their own brands, which is beautiful. That means we inspired them. Just going back you know, to what I said before about the, the fact that we interviewed you about two years ago. And you hear people say, like, a lot can happen in a year. But it's, it's been two years. So what's something that um, you would tell yourself two years ago? Oh, easy. Appreciate it. The process. Like, you hear people say that on TV. Like, you hear people lately say, trust the process. Right. But I think... You get it once you go through like all these stages of being an entrepreneur or just life in general. Right. Because if I can look back to the two years ago and talk to me, I say, look, you're going to go through some really tough things. But these are the things that are going to make you the great person that you aspire to be. Right. Like the goals that you have in mind, you, you're, there's no way that you can achieve those things without going through this two year process. There's no way that I would be opening the coffee shop right now if... I didn't go through what I went through in these last two years. Actually, the last two years is really what defined us as a brand. Because, like I said, we saw our, our roughest times. As an entrepreneur, as a person, my personal life. So, yeah, like, enjoy that. It's, it's hard, though. You could tell somebody that. But if you lock in on understanding, like, you know what? I know I'm about to go through some, through some shit. But I'm, I'm going to level, level up on it. Right. And, and I'm going I'm to soak in as much as I can, take in as much as I can. So I would say, yeah, just appreciate that part. Because if you're living in it, you're going to take more from it. But if you got to look back and say, oh, that's why you, you don't really have all of it. Yeah, you got some of it, but enjoy that process would be what I would say. And don't be afraid to make mistakes. That's part of the trusting process. Make, make mistakes. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's the, see, that's the thing. Though. I think a lot of people are afraid to make mistakes, man. I think that's why a lot of things don't start in general. Yeah. A lot of businesses, everything. People are afraid to mess up. A lot of times in front of certain people, whether it's a, a parent or a friend or whatever. A like, community. Because, mm. you know, like talking about Instagram, people start stuff all the time and it may not go well. And, you know, Instagram is a place that can make or break you in a day's time. So I think now... With the world being so small, people are afraid to shoot their shot because they don't want people to look at them as failures. But all of the most successful people in the world have failed. Feel me? So um, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, if you ever down on your luck, play Macho Means Music. That'll fix everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So all those things, man. That's what make that's what make for success, man. Right. And if it I really gets bad, you gotta buy a black owned shirt. Like that always. That cures. Experience. Yeah. That yeah. cures it all, bro. For sure. The, mu the music. You gotta you gotta listen to the music you gotta, while you're wearing a shirt. Oh yeah. Well, and a that's, hat. That's like complete. Like I, I would say that's the like most like euphoric place you can be. Yeah. To be listening to Macho Means music and wearing a black owned shirt. It's nothing much. What if you did all of that inside the black owned store? See, then now we're going crazy. We're going crazy. Yeah. On a black owned couch. Damn. Dog, you good at this. With black owned glasses. Oh, man. We should stop now. We should, it's yeah. Gonna crazy. It's going to get crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I just got fin two final questions, man. What's two up? final questions. One, what is your definition of greatness? My definition of greatness would be um, living fearless. Mm -hmm. I think you're, you're your greatest. When you just, you're not afraid because, man, like, it's so many bright ideas in all of us. It's so much that we owe to society, to the people that's going to come behind us. But a lot of us die with that inside of us. And that, that's just fear. So if you ask what's greatness, being great is releasing all of that before you go saying that you live a long life, you know what I mean? But th that's what greatness is, is not dying with it inside of you, releasing it so someone else can use it. So um, for me to be great, between now and the time I kick the bucket, like I want to release all of this, you know, it's, it's these creative things, these, these coffee shops, these spaces like this, um, motivational speaking, dropping the albums, it's releasing all of that, man, because right. people are really, they're living off of what you create. So I'm going to be great because I'm, I'm going to stand up to anything. I'm fearless, and I'm not afraid of, of anything. There's not a person, God only. 
sometimes I'm afraid of myself because of that. Because I'm like, to this point in my life where it's like nothing can stop me. Mm. And when you talk like that, people say, oh, he's arrogant. You know what I mean? But hopefully they'll get to a point in their life where they'll talk like that too because that has nothing to do with arrogance. That has something to do with wanting to be great. Right. So. Uh, mm. And you don't want to, like I heard somebody say that one of the wealthiest places in the world is a cemetery. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Because in the cemetery you got businesses, multi-billion dollar businesses never started. Books never written, yeah. you know, a bunch of stuff. Um, and so, I mean, none of us want to, you know, die with all that stuff, like you said, inside of us. You want to release all of that to the world. Yeah. You know? uh, so my final question, at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, the coffee shop is done what you wanted to do. Your music has done what it, black owned has, it's become a global brand. What do you want people to say at the end of the day? Macho means was. Macho means was. One of the greatest of our time. I mean, just to keep it simple, you know, when we think about LeBron, we say he's one of the greatest of our time. If people say that, I'm happy because what greatest of our time mean that they got to see me living out my dreams or I contributed enough to the culture where they value me. It's one of the greatest. So that means that I released all those things. So I just want people to just say, you know, I look at me and say, yeah, he left something behind, something that people can build on. I feel like, I often feel like, and this may be selfish of me, but I often feel like I started with nothing, you know what I mean? Like when I, when I graduated from high school, I had no money, go to college. When I graduated from college, I had a bunch of debt, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's these starting points, like starting your life already 40 something thousand dollars in debt, you know, or starting your life with no men there in place to guide you. So I, I just want to be able to leave those things behind so that the people that I'm connected to, and that's not just people that I mean, you know, that's in my family, that's the people that I somehow reach. The, the viewers on this interview are people that I'm connected to. Like, I want them to be inspired by what I'm doing. So, the greatest of our time. The GOAT. That's the GOAT. The GOAT. To be in that conversation, to be mentioned as one of the GOATs. Amazing. I appreciate you, man. Appreciate you taking out Thank your you, time, Brian. man. Um, you're, the growth is it's only up from here for sure. It's only up from here, man. And until for you next, too, absolutely. Like I'm, I'm, I'm digging what you're doing, bro. Because you ain't got no paper. Oh, maybe you did have some notes, but yeah, man, had some notes. You did it in a way that I didn't know. <laughs> right, that was clean. I'm like, I, these questions is good. Right, yeah. I appreciate that, man. I definitely appreciate that. Um, and for you watching, just one thing that I that I got from this is being fearless, man. That's one of the main things. Um, that I got from this, being fearless, uh, taking ownership from your, of yourself, you know, whatever goal or dream that you have, because everybody has a dream. Everybody has goals, something that they want to accomplish. It may not be what this guy wants or that girl wants or this person wants, but everybody has something. But like you said, the first thing you got to do before you try to own something is own yourself. Indeed. From a place where the pain gon' show From the block, watch your rose gon' grow Put the show on the road People died it, so I'm kicking down the door Oh no, I never sell my soul Gotta stick to the cold To the top, I ain't never coming down Through the hurt, man, I still keep a smile I'ma be here for a while Want the people around the world to hear the sound Greatness, I ain't never stopping now I ain't never stopping now From a place where the pain gon' show From the block, watch your